dynamics of hybrid democratic authoritarian regimes. Uh, so today's talk is co-hosted with Sydney Democracy Network and Ukraine Democracy Initiative. So thanks to Janice for organizing a uh, huge part for you know say, uh, hanging the signs there so everyone could find the way. And uh, today we're also broadcasting our um, talk, um, and you can watch it live if you just tweet. If you just actually go to our Twitter or Sydney Democracy Twitter, or you can pass it to someone who missed out today, who couldn't come. Yeah, so everything will be recorded as well and will be put to Ukraine Democracy Initiative uh, YouTube channel. So you'll have a chance as well to review it for some more information. So today, uh, Luca will talk about the sources of political contestation in Ukraine and the rest of the former Soviet Union and beyond. Yes, yeah, so Luca proposes that pl pluralism in Ukraine and other new democracies is often grounded less in democratic leadership than an emerging civil society or, po uh, or political power, and more in failure of authoritarianism. Yeah. So we can, we're very delighted to have you here great. today. Thanks for traveling so far. And all floor is yours now. Great, great. Thank you, Olga. Um, So far, um, I'm the farthest away I've ever been from home. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that was um, my, my kids were very impressed by how far I, I'm coming. Um, and they want me to bring back a baby kangaroo that told me was not really realistic, but um, they still have their hopes. Anyway, today I want to talk about um, my book, which just came out recently. Uh, and in terms of so the broader theoretical question that this book examines is why after the Cold War did you see the emergence of so many countries of, with highly pluralistic regimes in countries that otherwise lack sort of what we consider standard democratic prerequisites. So if these were economically underdeveloped, had weak rules of law, and faced relatively weak external pressure for democracy. And indeed, after the Cold War, you had a doubling of the share of democracies among less developed countries. So you had a really a surge of these sort of de democracies without prerequisites, as Stephen Fish once called them. And to examine this question, I look at former Soviet Union. I, the, the heart of this book is a three-case comparison um, of Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus, which are, as most of you know, you know, quite the, next to each other from the same region, uh, very similar in many ways, but they have very different democratic outcomes. Ukraine and Moldova are highly pluralistic, Belarus much less so. And so the question is basically why uh, are these two countries relatively democratic, whereas Belarus um, is not? That's the heart of the book, and then I sort of afterwards examine um, the rest of the former Soviet Union. But really, in terms of page numbers, Ukraine is truly the, both the biggest country and the biggest part of the book. Uh, now, the standard wisdom in the literature is that uh, democracy or pluralism emerges out of what might be called positive factors, I think civil society. So, whenever a country has a democratic revolution, you talk about an emerging civil society, people talk about democratic leadership, uh, well designed institutions, or democratic culture. Now, my argument is that basically none of these things really explain why. Uh, Moldova and Ukraine were so uh, pluralistic and democratic, um, and much more so than any other country in the former Soviet Union. Instead, we, I argue that pluralism emerged out of weak, authoritarian weakness rather than the strength of democratic forces. So it was less of strong civil society, less well designed institutions, and much more undeveloped ruling parties, dysfunctional state, and a, and a divided society. So um, that's the take home message. So. I expect you to recite it after, <laughs> after the lecture. If you don't, I'll be very disappointed. Um, so basically, you know, the question of what um, explains the divergence among democratic outcomes in the former Soviet Union has been, you know, I'm not the first one to study this. The first approach really looks at constitutional design. Uh, as some of you may know, um, in the political science literature, presidentialism is considered bad for democracy. Parliamentarism is considered good. Um, <clears throat> This is, you know, well, you know, this is a, a very developed literature. The problem uh, when you apply to the former Soviet Union is twofold. First, 
as many of you know, rules are, general, are, are often not followed. So it's hard to sort of, you know, have too much faith in a theory which boots itself in the efficacy of institutional rules, when institutional rules themselves are tend to be very weak. Second, oftentimes, um, the constitutions themselves are the product of authoritarianism rather than their cause. So, super-presidentialism in Ukraine, and sorry, in Russia, was formed after Yeltsin had bombed parliament. So it's really the other way around. It's not that the super-presidential constitution caused authoritarianism in Russia, it's that you bomb parliament and you get a very authoritarian constitution. Um, Henry Hale, my colleague, um, has similar, you know, in a kind of more nuanced argument, said that competition in the former Soviet Union is a function of term limits, that you know, term limits create pluralism because it forces um, autocrats to lead power. Um, I don't find this to be terribly convincing. Above all, um, it doesn't explain why most autocrats in the former Soviet Union simply ignored term limits whilst others followed them. So it really kind of begs the question of why are the institutional rules followed in some cases, but not in others. Next, uh, people have argued that civil society um, is what has explained especially pluralism in Ukraine. There's been a lot of discussion of uh, civil society in Ukraine, emerging civil society, both during the Orange Revolution in 2004, as well as more recently Euromaidan. Now, there's certainly an element of truth to this. Um, I think, you know, relatively speaking, I think civil society is a bit more dynamic in Ukraine than in some other places. But really, if you, it doesn't really explain the most distinguishing fact about Ukraine, which is the, the fact that, that millions of people have come out into the streets to overthrow autocrats. In fact, most studies of, autocrat, of, of protesters show that the vast majority came out spontaneously rather than being organized by any kind of civil society student or other organization. So there's really not much evidence that civil society per se explains these very spectacular crowds both in 2004 and 2014. And also work by Mark Weisinger um, very sophisticated statistical analysis by Mark Weisinger at Princeton. He also shows that civil society doesn't really explain uh, a turnout at these mass protests. Next, um, democracy in Ukraine is oftentimes explained by democratic culture. So you have this sort of argument that you have Cossack democracy in Ukraine versus more collective mentality in Belarus. And I don't find this terribly convincing. First of all, if you look at support for democracy in Belarus, um, and in Moldova, Ukraine, it's about the same. Um, and furthermore, Ukrainian protesters, as Mark Weisinger shows, actually in 2004 were not particularly supportive of democracy, surprisingly enough. But they actually uh, more opposed multi party democracy in 2004 than supported it. So it's not really obvious that they were you know, necessarily you know, out there to sort of support democracy per se. Finally, um, a very common theory is to say, well, what if maybe it's about democratic leadership? Maybe it's because you know, leaders in uh, Ukraine and Moldova just were nicer people, less authoritarian. I don't find this terribly convincing because basically you have to believe that somehow all eight leaders of Moldova and Ukraine were co coincidentally more democratic than in Belarus. You know, that's a lot of leaders, and you know, maybe they all were nice people, but you know, Yanukovych was not particularly nice. Um, really be stretching it to call him nice. That's really concept stretching. Um, someone who beats up his ministers. Um, that's not very nice. Okay. So I don't think that's sort of the standard wisdom. You know, some of them, part of the way, they're not completely irrelevant, but they really don't explain this variation in outcome between Moldova, Ukraine on one side and Belarus on the other. Instead, I argue that these, uh, Ukraine and Moldova are uh, uh, examples of what we call pluralism by default. These are cases where pl political competition emerges out of weak authority authoritarian institutions rather than democratic strength. Uh, you know, you know, you know, it's better to see these countries as weak authoritarian regimes rather than as emerging democracies. So to understand the sort of intuition behind pluralism and bias fault, I want to take you back to another time, 1994. Yeah, I don't know how many of you recognize who this man is. Landon Kravchuk, the first president of Ukraine. So he's best known for the fact that he left power after one term. Um, I remember attending a, a lecture in 1995 by Roman Skorlok, and he said the best part of Ukraine is that there's a, they have a former president. 
And that's the biggest sign of success. And indeed, you know, that is, you know, there was a peaceful turnover of power, which is quite remarkable. The problem is, if you look closely, it becomes much more complicated. Now, Kratzuk was nice enough to publish memoirs in 2002 in which he described this turnover. And what he tells us, surprisingly, is, is that he actually tried to cancel the elections in 1994. He, you know, he agreed to elections and he said, yeah, yeah, I don't want this election stuff. So let's, uh, let's, let's delay it. So he actually had already agreed on a date when he was going to announce on television when the elections were going to be canceled. He was going to shut down Parliament. And then sort of, and that's sort already of, it felt like, you know, like classic transition to authoritarianism. But then he met with the security officers in the military in Ukraine. And they basically said, our soldiers haven't been paid. There's no way they can actually carry this out. So he backed down. And they held elections and he lost them to Lena Kravchuk and the rest is history. So in other words, um, Ukraine's first democratic turnover was not a function of democratic leadership. I mean, he wanted to cancel elections. It was not a function of a strong institution. It was the fact that the state was dysfunctional and weak. So it's a really different way of understanding pluralism than we typically see. Okay, so basically I argue that three different factors, underdeveloped ruling party, weak authoritarian state, and divided national identity in the region have contributed to pluralism. First, um, underdeveloped ruling party, basically I mean the existence or absence of a single well-developed ruling party. Next, uh, weak authoritarian state. Now this is, by state here, I don't mean the warm and fuzzy state, the kind of state that distributes health care or that you know, provides education. I'm talking about the, the horrible, repressive state that, that cracks down on the population and, and shoots people. Right? Um, and basically, what I'm arguing is that when you don't have a well-funded security apparatus where, where soldiers aren't paid or police aren't paid, um, you know, that contributes to pluralism. And also, where state control over the economy is relatively weak, that also contributes to pluralism. Finally, I, you know, the third factor is the divided national identity. And what I mean here basically is our national identities that are divided between two relatively equal and politically settling groups, basically where East, um, this is in essence or East-West Ukraine before 2014, where um, each side could plausibly gain power, so this is not like, you know, tiny breakaway region versus the rest of the country, but, you know, a place like Ukraine or Bangladesh, if anybody wants to talk, I can talk endlessly about Bangladesh if you're interested, it's a fascinating country, there are huge similarities between Bangladesh and Ukraine, but nonetheless, um, Okay, so basically, the argument here is that, you know, the lack or underdevelopment of a ruling party contributes to elite defection, which strengthens the op op um, opposition challenges. Next, you have a weak authoritarian state. That basically, these states lack the capacity, as in the example I opened up with, with Kravchuk, to basically steal elections or to crack down on opposition. And finally, a divided national identity, basically, because national identity is often so emotive and sort of people are very passionate about national identity, it makes it much easier for opposition to mobilize on each side against the incumbent, whoever they may be. Um, so this basically introduces passion into politics, which makes it easier for opposition to mobilize, even when, you know, when they face repression or there's a weak civil society. Okay, so, the, the book is basically is about these two cases, Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine, and I, and I cover two puzzles. The first is, you know, cross case why Moldova and Ukraine were more democratic than Belarus. And second, within case, why do you see changes over time? And I'm arguing that my argument basically explains both of these. In a nutshell, the difference in national divisions explains uh, across case. Within case, you see changes over time in state and party capacity. So first, a variation of cross case, as, as some, many of you in this room probably know, um, both Ukraine and Moldova are relatively, have been relatively divided. Countries between Russophiles and Ukrainophiles in, in Ukraine, and between Russophiles and Europeanists or Romanians in Moldova. And basically what these divisions did was that in the early 1990s they contributed to really profound nationalist mobilization. Uh, which in turn led to the partial destruction of the authoritarian state. So in Ukraine, um, you see the emergence of uh, you know, regional power structures uh, controlled by RUK, the nationalist RUK, 
Um, it was basically, basically made it impossible even if Prat Chupik wanted to, to crack down on the opposition in Lviv in West Ukraine because he didn't control the state there. The police would, would simply not have followed orders. Over a longer period of time, um, what you also find is that it leads to a relatively stable, ready-made opposition between uh, Russophiles and Ukrainophiles. The parties um, in Ukraine until 2014 could easily be sort of classified along these lines. There's been a lot of stuff about, you know, is Ukraine divided into two or, or one? You know, is it nine different divisions, whatnot? I'm happy to discuss that. But crudely speaking, you could, you know, it is useful, politically speaking, to make this distinction between East and West Ukraine, although it is a simplification. Um, and it actually is no longer divided in the same way today, you know, after the war with Russia than it was before the war with Russia. But I can discuss that. Happy to discuss that later. Okay. So basically, the argument here is that, you know, first you look at, you know, the four turnovers that occurred in Ukraine, the three in Moldova, each has basically, been, you know, been from one national, you know, side of the national divide to the other. So all turnovers and ruling coalitions have been between these different sides. And in the mobilization, mass mobilization, in both countries in 89 and 91, and in Ukraine in 93, 2004, and 2013, 2014, you, you know, there's a profound role to regional identity. So, you know, crudely speaking, basically both the Orange Revolution in 2004 and the Euromaidan in 2014 were dominated by, by people from both Kiev, Kiev, and as well as Western Ukraine. So this was, and all sorts of studies um, have shown that Ukrainian speakers were dominated, you know, um, speaking Ukrainian really predicts participation in these protests. So these you know, were really, you know, the, the size of these protests and this has been shown in a number of different studies by a number of different surveys, you know, was really predicated and, and encouraged by these national divisions, much more than support for democratic values. So that really explains why you have in Ukraine these turnovers in these years. 1993, um, this is when uh, Kravchuk left power, was because it was the opposite, because of striking miners in eastern Ukraine. So again, it was a, a very regionalized protest. Um, at say, by contrast, Belarus is a much more, has been a much more weakly divided than any. Um, you know, basically what happens in, 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 in Belarus, Lukashenko um, comes to power. He, uh, he quickly centralizes power. He basically um, neuters the, uh, the, the parliament. And opposition, in contrast to Ukraine, is completely unable to muster support. Um, and his, the sort of Russophile nature of the population, um, after that, after 1996, allows him also to gain significant support from Russia. So um, the, the extent to which uh, Lukashenko has been able to consolidate authoritarian rule in Belarus, I think is strongly related to the country's uh, Russophile identity, and to relatively unified Russophile identity. Um, so next we see, so that's puzzle one, the variation between Belarus and Ukraine on one side, I'm sorry, Moldova and Ukraine on one side and Belarus on the other. The other puzzle is over time. So we, in both cases we see a variation um, over time. In, in Belarus, Belarus was much more democratic and pluralistic in the early 1990s and later. Um, and in, in Moldova and Ukraine you see shift um, between, you know, over the course of the 1990s, Ukraine is especially complicated, that has had the most turnovers. Um, and by the way, I have all sorts of indicators that I measure competition that are in the appendix, so um, um, Jamie will read them to you after the, the lecture, to see he had, he's nice enough, he's a good enough friend that he bought the book. Okay, um, so basically I, here, is here, what we find in Belarus is, uh, Initially, um, after the fall of the, of the Soviet Union, um, Belarus emerges as a you know, relatively weak state, you know, in many ways very similar to Moldova and Ukraine. Um, and what happens under Lukashenko is that Lukashenko actively rebuilds um, centralized control over the economy. A lot of my book is the story of this rebuilding um, through various institutions. He basically re you know, Gorbachev in the late 80s and basically destroyed the centralized control economy, the centrally controlled economy, the party was decimated under Gorbachev. 
go a Lukashenko comes to power and really makes an effort in an institution building. This kind of authoritarian institution building has been generally ignored in the literature because we tend to focus on the nice institution building, you know, writing constitutions, building courts, but there's also this other sort of dark, bad um, institution building that occurred and had no one, very few people have paid attention to. One, it's hard to find out about it, right? Um, and two, because it's just not how we think of it. We tend to sort of think in, 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 in somewhat teleological terms that we want and we look for what we want to you know, see. But I think we need to pay attention to the sort of dark forms of state building. And this is a really nice example in Belarus, or sort of interest, not nice, very not nice example um, in Belarus in the early 1990s. Um, Ukraine and Moldova, it's a, more or less the differences between these, uh, uh, between high and medium competition is a function of the degree to which you have the ruling coalition is organized among a single ruling party or not, so that you know, when you have Yanukovych who emerges to power with a, a relatively united and cohesive, by Ukrainian standards, uh, party of regions, and, you know, he, he's able to use this party to really clamp down on competition. Similarly, in, in Moldova, the emergence of a, a relatively cohesive communist party in 2001 also allows that to, them to sort of establish much greater degree of, of, of authoritarianism. When you have sort of, you don't have such a party as under Kravchuk or Ukraine under you should go, that leads directly, and I, and I, I make a real effort to sort of show how these, you know, these organizational forms contribute to higher competition in the case studies. And, um, and I think it, um, it seems pretty clear that, that, um, that competition in Ukraine is really a function of the organization of the ruling coalition, whether or not it's organized into a ruling party or not. So that's basically um, the book. Hope you like it. Um, what, you know, how, so how does this apply to the rest of the former Soviet Union? Now, I don't have, you know, my, my, my editor said that I only had um, about 200 pages of text. I said, what about Russia? You know, sorry. No. So, um, so I have, like, I cover, you know, when I cover, like, I cover Ukraine. I, my, originally, like, Ukraine was 150 pages, so I got it down to 60 pages, um, so I'm pretty impressed um, with myself. Um, but you know, the rest of the former Soviet Union, I think there's sort of at least initial evidence um, that it, this sort of fits the argument. First of all, I mean, so this is sort of the, uh, this is the rest of the former Soviet Union. Um, what we have here is the Freedom House score, the lower the score, the more democratic, the higher the score, the less democratic. These are the number of turnovers. This is um, between sort of ruling coalitions. Um, you know, when when an, a figure from outside of the regime comes to power, so um, this kind of gives you a sense of pluralism, both these. And what we and now what we first notice is that clearly my variables aren't the only thing going on. That there's Central Asia. And there's a big regional factor. You know, Central Asia is overall much more authoritarian than is uh, the Western former Soviet Union. Um, but however, within these regions you see a rough correlation between um, sort of um, incumbent capacity and national identity and levels of pluralism. So within the Western former Soviet Union, there's a low split of both, you know, uh, both which has much, uh, much weaker splits and national identity is more authoritarian. Um, in Armenia, where you have, the way I, I um, code these variables are all, none of them sort of have this sort of split in identity but you see a short, a really um, clear correlation amongst the, the three cases. You know, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> but nonetheless, it's sort of just interesting. You know, Georgia, which has by far the weakest state, has the greatest degree of pluralism, whereas um, Armenia and Azerbaijan, which have stronger states, tend to be less pluralistic. Central Asia, more or less roughly, works. Tajikistan really does not work for my argument. You have a very weak state, um, and um, that's just a case that doesn't work sometimes. Cases don't work. What do you do? Um, you know, I tried to talk to them, but they, they weren't willing to be democratic. It fit my argument. They didn't care. Um, they didn't care whether I got tenure. I was so angry. You know, why, why wouldn't they care about getting, uh, getting tenure? Um, anyways, uh, but more specifically, you know, if you lo I look at all 27 incumbents in the former Soviet Union, and we find that among those incumbents backed by a relatively weak party state. Or have a highly oops, have a highly divided identity. Um, very few of these um, incumbents survive more than two terms. 
we have 16, the exceptions are uh, Morris Yeltsin um, in the 1990s uh, and uh, some others. By contrast, those incumbents backed by a relatively strong party in, or state and with a weakly divided identity they tend to be, survive for much longer, they tend to, tend to be much more durable. So 9 of 11 incum incumbents with strong party state and less divided national identity survived for more than two terms or gave power to someone within the regime. So, these, you know, so you know, again, this is correlation, is not causation. This is simply sort of kind of, a, you know, but this gives you a sense that it perhaps works. I, try, I do sort of, in the book, provide some very basic case studies that there is actually substantive case study evidence to support this. Um, um, we also see um, some evidence over time um, so that, uh, you know, now it's interesting if you compare the impact of civil society versus authoritarian strength, they come up with conflicting expectations. So over, you know, civil society was obviously, you know, very repressed during the Soviet period, during the totalitarian era. So we might expect that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, so these, you know, places are still authoritarian, but much less repressive than in the Soviet Union, that over time, as civil society got stronger, got more experienced, you see an increase in democracy, whereas, from my perspective, you think well, the opposite, that sort of over time, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, you see a gradual increase in, in, in state and party strength, and that should lead to a decrease in democracy, and indeed, you see a stark decrease in democracy in almost all post-Soviet cases, and indeed, um, you know, in specific cases, it's very clear, like in Azerbaijan, where there's real state building, you know, as well as uh, in, in Russia, well, state building that, you know, directly can be um, shown to contribute the reduction in democracy. So there's again sort of at least preliminary evidence that um, that it, it, that basically pluralism emerges out of failure of the state party rather than out of sort of nice things like uh, civil society or well-designed institutions. Okay. Um, so to conclude, um, to understand democratization, you need to look at. Not just that you know, the, you know, the forces we like, civil society, development, well-designed institutions, but the strength of authoritarian institutions. In other words, we have to you know, you know, actually examine, does the leader have the capacity to impose authoritarian rule or not? And it's oftentimes not. And basically, all good things don't go together. And so I'm going to try to tell my kids, but they don't believe me. Um, so I'm hoping you'll believe me. Um, that, you know, some, that we have nice things like pluralism that actually emerge to an important extent out of state failure, and that what promotes competition may also undermine economic reform and long-term democratic development. And polls and I thought, while they're more democratic, are not really nice places to live. You would, you know, these tend to be places with relatively weak institutions. Um, but there you go. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, right? Yeah. So, should we open it to discussion? Yes? So, so such a rich, yeah, such a rich uh, talk and a lot of evidence, right? Which is so provoking. So, if you have someone have a question, yeah, we can start the discussion. I can ask a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lukin. Uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about uh, how you actually define pluralism. You never really yeah. define that. So, what is that? Uh, and then specifically. What kind of thing is that? Uh, what category of thing? It's not a regime type, uh, I don't think, or maybe it is. So if you could, uh, and then also um, one of the interesting implications of your theory uh, seems to be that ethnic heterogeneity is actually good for uh, pluralism, or at the very least, is bad for consolidated authoritarianism. That kind of flies in the face of one of the big findings in comparative politics, which is that ethnic ethnic heterogeneity makes it more difficult to maintain democracy. So if you could just speak to that, that would be great. Yeah, two things. First, how do we find both? I have four dimensions. Um, media freedom, um, electoral for degree of electoral fraud, uh, parliamentary power versus presidential power, um, and then basically opposition strength, right? Do we have a viable opposition to win power? Um, so you know, this does not directly um, correspond to democracy, although if you have high competition at all level, most of these come pretty damn close to democracy, so there's a rough correlation. It's not exactly the same. You know, for example, I didn't call it democracy because 
we, we never define, no, there's no definition of democracy that says that, for example, they have to necessarily have a, a very powerful parliament, because some of these are not part of the definition of democracy. But there's definitely a rough correlate, you know, pretty strong correlation between my measures of pluralism and uh, democracy. It's true what you say that um, ethnic rationalization or, um, is oftentimes, you know, the evidence um, is that it undermines democracy, and I think that's most, that is, I'm not disputing this claim, I'm talking about, that's why I'm really talking about a very specific kind of fragmentation, which is e relatively evenly divided. So these are not cases, you know, ethnic right, can be like, you know, Catalonia or Chechnya, right, that can, you know, um, but these are, and, and I think in those cases where you have, you know, for example, um, a large um, national identity, you know, facing a secession threat, um, which is, you know, more, most cases, um, you know, that can actually very rightly sort of promote authoritarianism. But these are very specific cases where there's a relative division, so that in these cases, there are like five or six that I identified on Mozambique in the 1990s, uh, Bangladesh, Albania, um, uh, Kyrgyzstan, to a lesser extent. These are cases where I think the divide um, does more to sort of undermine, you know, kind of equally undermine authoritarianism. And, and this divide also undermines democracy. I want to be clear, you know, what promotes pluralism does not necessarily promote long-term democratic development, as we saw in 2014. I mean, certainly the national divide in Ukraine did not particularly um, promote democratic consolidation in 2014. I mean, um, it, you know, sort of gave an opening for Putin to, to sort of make, wreak havoc in Ukraine. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's pretty striking evidence, empirical evidence, and survey evidence that it did a lot to promote pluralism both in Ukraine Moldova. So that, yeah, this is a very different way of looking at identity and democracy, but my definition of, you know, it's a very much more narrow, specific definition, so I'm not sure it really contradicts it per se. I, I don't have a sort of a measurement of all countries that I, I could do that. Um, but yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually have a several questions. Um, yeah. structure that's able to enforce um, compliance. Mm -hmm. And basically what Gorbachev did, and this is not a controversial view at all, I mean this is obvious to anybody who knows the history of Perestroika, was he systematically destroyed the Communist Party. In 1988 at the, um, at the 19th Party Conference, he took the economic levers of power away from the party. He maintained the leadership of the party, he, he you know, created all this political competition, and he specifically remained the head of the party in order to prevent the party from actually responding to this emerging competition. If you read any you know, history of the party apparatus from the late 80s and early 1990s, it's a highly atomized structure, which is you know, you know, as far away from Leninism as you could possibly imagine. And so what's interesting is that many people have talked about the atomization of civil society in, of, you know, in the former Soviet Union, which is absolutely true. What they don't talk about it is that the ruling elite in the early 90s was also highly atomized. I mean, that's, you know, if you look at Stephen Solnit's work, that's why the Soviet Union collapsed relatively peacefully. They didn't have an organizational ethos. They were also trying just to, to get as much money as possible. So there was a very individualized process. So this, not, you know, yes, 
having a background in the normal clitoris help you get a connection, but that's not the same thing as a piece of linen as part of it's able to enforce a compliance you know, organization. Since you mentioned the targeting religious, to what extent religious is important when considering new transformations in the form of your society as opposed to uh, the role of leadership and uh, leadership entrepreneurship in uh, enforcing the new type of regime. Sorry, I actually... How important is the lead as opposed to the leader in, in the new society? So the lead as a whole, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think that... You have um, mentioned the really lead. You, all, all, the main emphasis on leadership as opposed to leads. Well, I think, you know, it's, you know this is, you know, I'm mostly pretty elitist story. It's about the elite, and I think that, um, I think that the masses do come in in the story, but I think um, they are very important. And, um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, you know, of what you mean by the elites. I mean, um, you mean people with no cultural background? I mean, certainly they were the main players in this story. I mean, in, 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 certainly in Moldova and Ukraine, Lexan, Kotor, you know, Pavchuk, Mishar Snegor, they're all from this elite, but they, you know, they're fighting, they're battling each other, they're not, you know, they're not. I'm just referring to your yeah. last slide and the last question. Does leader have capacity to impose authoritarian rule? What about the elite? Do they have capacity? And how, how important is it? Well, I just, I don't know, I mean, do you mean, I guess the question is, I'm looking at it from the autobots point of view. I think the question is, do they have capacity? You know, I think, uh, you know, I'm not so comfortable with the term elite because it applies some sort of organizational unity that, that oftentimes doesn't exist and the elite doesn't, you know, you know, they, they used to always talk about in the, in the Ukraine in the early 1990s, the party of power, which is sort of what you're talking about. But that was always the you know unsatisfying term because there was no party of power. It was just a bunch. It's like um, it was just a bunch of people with you know similar backgrounds. There wasn't any kind of party that had, there was no organizational entity that you know they didn't meet anywhere, right? It was you know no kind of elite in sort of the kind of any kind of unified sense. I mean, except that all were people with um, you know, sort of social capital. But, um, so yeah. So. Make out our, our okay. No, I mean, I mean, it's pretty much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Two, can, two questions, if you don't mind. Yes. The first is if the uh, ethnic heterogeneity is a, is a condition for the growth of Ukraine, then the civil war will ironically get given Eastern Ukraine a more tendency towards a more autocratic state. And the next question is about generation, because the generation, young generation of Belarus is less Russellified than the older one, from what I know. So is it because is it is it only applied to a certain critical uh, conjunction in a in, in, in a state building that actually stop it or help it from curtailing consolidation rather than uh, have, has an ongoing conditions for whether curtailing like or tourism by people to appeal. Right. Um, so both are really great questions. So the first question um, is yes. So it's nice that you know, I think you have. You know, I think these aren't immutable. You know. Entities, you know, countries change over time. And the war most definitely unified Ukraine. <laughs> I think most people agree that it. first of all, it took off huge sections of the country dominated by Russians. And second, you know, the country's under threat. So nationalism has become a factor now in Ukraine that it never was before. Um, at the same time, though, Ukraine is an insanely weak state right now. Um, and therefore, um, you know, very vulnerable to outside pressure. And so, you know, I think, you know, there's a storage. Um, Probably true, but I don't know. Um, but you know, Luke, that Poroshenko decided to sort of have um, uh, to impose martial law, but basically was convinced one he couldn't pull it off; they didn't have the you know the capacity to pull it off. And two, Obama said, yeah, yeah, "That's not going to happen. You're going to aid. You're going to be withdrawn right away." Um, so you know, the, so I think overall, I think the identity, sort of the coding of the Ukrainian identity right now, would support greater authoritarianism. So um, that's definitely the case. Um, Next, you know, Belarus, um, great question. I think there has been a change. I think there was this period of sort of uh, Russo romanticism in, in Belarus in the 1990s. They really saw Russia as kind of how, you know, the rest of the Europe saw the EU as sort of the savior of Belarus. That's no longer the case. There's much more, much less support for union with Russia. Um, and I do think there has been a sort of uh, kind of a bit of a movement away from Russia, although it's not really clear from the survey evidence, because I think also a lot of uh, Belarusian opposition um, see Russia as the sort of only hope. I mean, you know, that's how desperate the Belarusian opposition is. If your only hope is, Bel is Putin, um, is, you know, is not particularly hopeful situation. So I'm not sure. Um, I think there has um, been a sort of increasing opposition to uh, union with Russia, but I don't think it's still Russophile in nature. 
most of the survey evidence. They still see, Bella, Bella, most of the uh, population still sees Belarus as sort of part of the Eurasian sphere uh, culturally. Uh, but, so. I think there was a question, yeah. Uh, your first line of the conclusion uh, provoked the thought that understanding <laughs> democratization, you need to look at authoritarian. <coughs> authoritarian institutions, and for some reason I thought immediately of Singapore, and there's a lot of people in Australia who look over their shoulder at the success achieved by authoritarian states, and uh, it, it hardly leads to democratisation, but are you pointing out that uh, to understand or to promote democratisation, you need to somehow extract effective measures out of authoritarian institutions. I still don't believe they offer a solution, even in the extraction process. But they're some of the thoughts that uh, your first line provoked, uh, and, and that was just a, a Gordian knot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, first of all, actually, I, this is a little misleading. I'm not actually, I think that, you know, I'm not saying the sort of more classical transition democracy is the way I sort of showed the slide of so their notion sort of kind of a kind of bottom up is wrong. I think more what I'm saying is that in many cases where um, you see pluralism is very strong, but you know, in countries that lack what we consider sort of standard democratic requisites such as economic development or particularly strong civil society, it's very likely that this pluralism is, is emerges from authoritarian weakness. So this is and this is definitely not a great way to get stable democracy, pluralism by default tends to be quite unstable, and almost by definition, because you have these weak states which um, tend not to promote democratic consolidation. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of Singapore, absolutely, you know, that's you know the opposite of Ukraine in the 1990s, a very effective authoritarian state, which is I think probably one of the reasons why it hasn't democratized, and also control of all, over all the housing that really helps me, <laughs> um, and the fact that it's a city state. But anyways, or a number of, I'm sure you guys know Singapore better than I do, but I'm used to talking about things I don't know about, so, um, anyways. Uh, what do you think about uh, all this geopolitics and conspirological theories which Russia mainly uh, introduced when we speak about Ukraine? Uh, do you believe that it was really influence of uh, whatever third uh, party, or um, it was uh, really uh, the main engine was Ukrainian uh, civil society in this revolution process? I mean, the last two in 2004 and 2014. So you say that with, with, was Euromaidan a function of? Yeah, I say, I say that the main theory in Russia now yeah. is that it was everything was inspired from outside, from mainly US. Yeah. US. And uh, what is your position? That's wrong. Is it? That's totally wrong. There's no evidence of that. I mean, believe me, in 2014, the opposition could not control the opposition, much less Obama or the CIA controlling the opposition. And it was, you know, um, there's simply no evidence. I mean, um, if what you mean, you know, the sort of, um, you know, Jonathan Steele, I think, wrote um, in The Guardian about the Orange Revolution that the U.S. orchestrated, and that's, you know, sorry for the term, just completely ridiculous. There's just no evidence whatsoever. I mean, you know, certainly the U.S., you know, provided a lot of assistance to Ukraine, um, but uh, there's no evidence that they were somehow controlling it. I mean, if we're that easy to have, but only if we're that easy to sort of over the world government, it was much more a function of, um, of the regional divisions. There really is clear you know, evidence that there was a regional division in Ukraine which helped basically provide the bulk of the protesters in both 2014 and um, 2004. Um, so, and I think, I mean, it's obviously, it's very much a product of Putin's worldview. He very much sees everything. I mean, you know, that's an elite, an elite, the way you're thinking about it, that really, you know, really that, you know, the Cold War was a wonderful time for them, and they tend to see everything sort of from the perspective of the Cold War as being about U.S. versus uh, Russia. But there's a little country called Ukraine, and I think domestic, you know, conditions in Ukraine basically um, 
overwhelmingly are the dominant factor in explaining both these events. Just to follow up on that, if possible. Um, I do agree that, that one of the main traditions in Russia is the importance of geopolitical factor. However, the, the, there is one small clarification about that. How media portrayed uh, the initial conflict uh, in Ukraine, uh, how Russian media portrayed the initial conflict in Ukraine, that it all started against corruption, that people were unsatisfied with the system, they were unsatisfied with economic conditions, and they protested against corruption. And later on, uh, external factors initially, West and then Russia intervened. So part of the literature and part of the media discourse in Russia, the, the, the initial protest in Ukraine, were not about uh, uh, joining either the European Union or Russia. It was against uh, the economic problems and against corruption. So that's yeah, I'm not sure I actually completely agree with that in the sense that, um, I mean, I was there in December, and I mean, the first protest was really against the fact that they, you know, which did not sign the European agreement. And, you know, there was, it's interesting that you said that, to, you know, you wonder, like, you, how, you know, these events were contingent. And I remember when I was there in December thinking, you know, where does this demonstration go, right? Where do these protests go? And one way, which I thought would have been great, it would have just been an anti-corruption demonstration, because East-West Ukraine, everybody hates corruption, right? That united Ukraine. But they really, the, you know, the top people um, and um, so Boda party, the you know, right-wing party, they really made an active decision to make this anti-Russian. And that, and that was the decision. And I remember, and they also made a decision to allow John McCain onto the stage in December of 2013, which was just, just enormously stupid. It was just, you know, why, why divide the country, right? Why antagonize the split when there is an issue? Everybody hated Yanukovych. I mean, everybody in 2013. Oh, you know, East-West, he was a corrupt bastard and not a very nice guy. And you know, could punch his minister of transport and stuff. And, you know, people don't like that. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I think, that, you know, I, I don't think that in any way um, the opposition, you know, was responsible for the war. That was, the war was really, you know, Putin. Um, but I think they were responsible for, for um, heightening divisions in the country um, in a way that didn't necessarily have to happen. Um, and, yeah, so. Yeah. It seems you didn't get to So I think Russia, um, in two ways, I think one, um, you know, Russia does not have a split identity, so, you know, you, you, know, you have much more, um, there's a Chechnya, which is, you know, a small regional conflict, and their nationalism, as in most authoritarian regimes, worked in favor of, 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 of authoritarianism. I mean, you know, most countries in the world that, you know, do not have these, like, um, you know, evenly split identity, nationalism really works in favor of authoritarianism, that's yeah, a kind of a, the fall to position of, of almost all autocrats. And what was distinctive about Moldova and Ukraine was that they really, these autocrats could not use nationalism because nationalism itself was so divisive. Right? You sort of nationalism, but who's nationalism? You know? So Russia and Ukraine, so they actually was kind of these weird autocrats who were unable to sort of use the classic mechanism of authoritarian rule. I mean, I mean so there aren't that many of these cases. Where, you know, so in this sense, I mean, I think um, in terms of my argument, um, Um, you know, if we think, you know, this is sort of, you know, in terms of its, you know, how much theoretical leverage this gives us, I mean, this is, a, you know, to be honest, a relatively few number of cases, I think, it really explains Bangladesh, so if you're interested in Bangladesh, but maybe not everybody is as interested in explaining Bangladesh, Bangladesh as I am. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, the, the first two really, I mean, if you look at the African, such an, I also have a kind of, a small section in the, in the conclusion on Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think you know this. You know there are a lot of pluralism by default and pluralism by default in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Benin, Mali. Um, you know these cases where you have. I mean, as in former Soviet Union, some of the most pluralistic democratic countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are, are, are ones that have really weak states um, and not really strong civil societies, and so you, you have a kind of similar dynamic. And, but, so Russia, so the first thing is it had sort of relatively unified identity. Second, I mean, there really was um, sort of a kind of as in Belarus, a kind of institution building that went on over time. You know, uh, uh, Putin built a, you know, Yel Yeltsin refused to build a party. Putin decided to build a party. Um, the state really strengthened in large part because of the infusion 
of, of, of wealth from um, oil that allowed you basically to impose authoritarianism. Here there's a really striking correlation between the increasing strength of the state on one side, the authoritarian state on one side, and decreasing pluralism on the other. So there's a real, in that case, it really explains, you know, I think it provides a lot of leverage to explain the reduction of pluralism over time in Russia. Question. Yeah. So I have like a, <clears throat> like, a, like a practical question. In terms of like a, a mindset change that should happen, like we tend to kind of like impersonate the evil or like into some leaders or, or kind of like po uh, politicians. Like this is because of this guy. And the revolution also came into like this is Yanukovych, this is his fault. If we remove him, everything's going to be great. Yeah. Or like, or you think we should better like go and stick into like parties, like trust parties rather than don't, don't look at who is inside? But if you know what, if I understood myself. I mean, you know, I, I do think, I mean, I'm not sure I completely understand your question, but I think that, um, I mean, in terms of, I mean, one thing I want to say is that I think that um, there tends to be a conflation of authoritarian breakdown with democratization, which I think is a real mistake. You know, these are, this is something I've written a lot in other contexts, but, you know, that really, you know, so the fall of Yanukovych is not democratization, I mean, I think, um, so I think it, it, there's a kind of, tends to be a personalization, you know, you get kind of wrapped up, you know, you know, in order to get, you know, democracy in Russia, all you need is to overthrow Putin, I'm not sure that's what... No, 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 it, it, it kind of like falls, but I mean, like, right. even, even now, people still talk about, like, you know, like, this guy is bad, this guy is bad, and, and you know, all those guys just um, burn their reputation, and, and they're all bad, 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 but should they still stick to the party, like, should they, like, Keep a big picture of a view of, of what's what's what who, what the players are like. Look at parties, or should I, mean, I people think basically? Look at, I mean, the know. irony here is, I mean, and this is sort of kind of one take-home message, is that you know the parties can be bad for democracy. Mm -hmm. That if you have a ruling party, I mean, in other words, I remember in the early 1990s, you know, many people thought, you know, what what Yeltsin has to do is he has to create a strong party, and that will make democracy. Well, wrong. If he had constrained the strong party, that would have made it easier for him to impose authoritarianism. So you know, that's the sort of rub in these contexts where there are, there are weak constraints on power, part, you know, ruling, you know, opposition party is always good, right? But ruling parties, you know, that can be quite detrimental to democracy. Yeah, that's what you said, like you had to have like few parties which are competing with each other yeah. all the time, but they should be individuals. Right, so that, you, know, the, you know, party building, I mean, isn't always, basically, that party building is not always good for and I think that's sort of the lesson from Russia um, and, uh, and, and Ukraine as well. I mean, the strongest, the most classic, strongest party in Ukrainian history has, was the party of region. I mean, it was a really disciplined party, the most professional party. It also would allow Yanukovych to pay the power in 2010 with this incredibly, constitutionally, Yanukovych in 2010 had incredibly weak powers. Now, that's what's interesting. You know, the classic institutional argument is that Yanukovych should have been weak. He had very few powers. It didn't matter, he had a, a very cohesive party. He could come within eight months to quickly establish a uh, near dictatorial rule. And, and it was, you know, through this party, the party of regions. So that's, I mean, one of the things I think is, um, I hope people notice.
the system is not stable. People don't think uh, Kyrgyzstan is politically, economically stable. Uh, and ne nevertheless, uh, in terms of its uh, political standard, it is ranked so high, higher than Kazakhstan even. Uh, right, because you have to distinguish between both not. There we have it. All good things don't go together. <laughs> Right, and then this is yeah, it's, it's totally, it's totally corrupt, it's totally unstable, you know, huge corruption, but it is more competitive. It's un, you know, unambiguous. Right? It's an institution then. Politically, you know, you had, you had two, you know, two turnovers. You have, I mean, um, you know, according to Freedom House, um, you know, a much more. I mean, it's not very different. This is four point seven. You know, this is no democracy. This is what but still, it's higher than Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is but this is not stability, this is competition, this is democracy. This is not about stability, quite the opposite. You know, it's about democracy. Right? It's about democracy. These are two different things. And, you know, those are, you know, whether or not you have um, you know, relatively competitive elections, whether or not you have relatively free media, this is not stability, you know. Right? Yeah, but then, the, when we speak about democracy, it's not only about literature, it's about institutions as well. And we will speak about uh, institutions in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, right, pluralism might have weak democracy. institutions. That's the whole point. That's my book. Yeah, but then why is higher than Kazakhstan? Because you have weaker institutions. Because you have institutions that are so weak, it's hard for a Kaya to impose authoritarian rule. Because the police aren't paid. You know, if you look online, it's great. You can actually see pluralism by default on YouTube. There's like a picture of this is in 2010, where you know the presidential palace, you have like these police. Um, they're just completely overrun by, you know, crowd. I mean, it's basically a riot, you know, and that, that's what how the, how the revolutions happen. Was, you know, you know, this is, comes from the work of wonderful work of Scott Radnitz. You know, this is a very very weak state, and that's why you have turnover. And that's precisely the point you know, that I'm trying to make is your point, um, which is that yes, I mean, we tend to you know, see um, Kurdistan, especially in the 1990s, under Kaya, was seen as sort of the, the Switzerland. You know, democracy, you know, democratic hope of Central Asia. Well, why? Because Akaya was so damn weak. It wasn't because Akaya was some Thomas Jefferson wannabe. It was because he had sort of no party connections, he had very weak institutions, and his and it's, and it's state was. So that's precisely, that is the point. But maybe you don't get it. <laughs> um, but you know, that is, I, I want to say that, you know, plural sometimes can oftentimes emerge out of weakness, not, I mean, we tend to think, and our mindset is that democracy and stability, all the good things, you know, they go together. It's free institutions. It's even freedom powers itself. They, they rank democracy according to several criteria. Why yeah, in, in terms of civil liberties, in terms of, you know, the extent to which they arrest opposition, the extent to which they suppress media. And I'm saying that, that, you know, that is in part a function of the institutional strength. That stronger institutions can make it more easy for autocrats to impose authoritarian rule and limit um, political freedom. Yep. Another question then, related yeah. to Kyrgyzstan. You've mentioned that ethnic yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 And there is a conflict in general composition among Kyrgyz. How 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 these models when yeah. ethnicity itself is not united? Yeah, absolutely. That's I mean, actually I do not actually. I, mean, I know it's confusing. I actually don't mean ethnic divide. Oh, mm -hmm. I mean it's within divisions within the titular identity. And so it's precisely the reason why I call it in mean, is precisely the north south Kyrgyzstan. You know, it's this sort of the um, um, that I'm talking about. So yeah, it's really not. I'm not talking about. Kyrgyz versus Uzbeks, and you know, this is, I don't think there's any reason to think that that kind of division, um, which is not even, you know, you know, helps democracy that you know, anything undermines plurals. But, yeah, so it's basically a regional divide. Uh, oh, So I, I sort of think of it as a you know, great question. And I, I tell you the truth, I haven't really investigated this. I mean, and basically, the way I see it is that it's an inverted U. You know, so you get you know, a certain weakness. Um, and then, um, but after, beyond a certain point, once 
you know, the state is so weak that you know, basically social order as such breaks down. You, know, you have basically Tajikistan. You know, you have the opposite relationship. So the, you know, these are, it's in a sense, and to use Dan Slater as sort of this, this sort of sweet middle, you know, where you have the sort of sufficiently weak states that are unable to impose authoritarian rule, but not so weak that the social order as such <laughs> breaks down in the civil war. So it is, so certainly there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, but you know that, you know, that has, you know, probably because of my case selection, um, you know, um, I, I, I'm a, you know, sort of almost another project. So, you know, what, what is that that point? Um, but that you know, that's a very important question. I have two questions. For yeah. You. Uh, so what you know, as as comparativists, we're all after findings that can generalize. As uh, you know, the, the more they can generalize, uh, the better. So you've touched on this a little bit, but I, 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 I'd love to hear a little bit more about how well <coughs> this theory travels. You said that the divided national identity thing probably doesn't travel that well, although maybe it works in some places. But the other components uh, presumably do travel. Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, you know, your other uh, big book or your other book is about competitive authoritarianism. How does your research on pluralism by default fit with your earlier work on competitive authoritarianism? Um, so the first question, I think, um, to the travel, I think um, it travels very well to, to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is another big region. It's not so bad. I mean, two big regions. So it's a, you know, it doesn't work at all for Central Europe or you know, or Latin America, where I think democratization follows a much more sort of classic, if you want to say, a path. Um, you know, both because you know external intervention and uh, well, external factors in Central Europe as well as civil society, this is like Poland or you know South. Korea. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, um, it helps, it basically explains a kind of particular kind of pluralism that emerges in these very weak states where you would not otherwise expect it to emerge. And I think that's not always, I mean, you, I, you, know, you have to really look for specific, I have, in my book I have a whole set of observable indications, which I, of course, forgot because I wrote it about two years ago. But you're welcome, I think it's on page 25. If you want to read it, I'm um, <laughs> It's very, very nice of you to sort of tell me that I can read my book for you. Um, anyways. Your, what was your Competitive authoritarian. Yes, I mean, many competitive authoritarian regimes are, you know, I mean, pluralism by default is a really important source of, of competitive authoritarian. These are kind of very much hybrid regimes that, um, I mean, there are periods in which Ukraine really meets um, the full definition of democracy, um, but they tend to be relatively brief and they kind of fluctuate between democracy and competitive authoritarianism. I mean, competitive authoritarian is sort of the modal um, regime type. Um, for these kinds of, I mean, very much Kyrgyzstan, uh, but, you know, Moldova, Ukraine, which are pretty stably um, competitive authoritarian, precisely because they were that weak institution. So. Yeah. Um, if, if I'm understanding like your previous book uh, correctly, uh, competitive authoritarianism is basically like two, play, two teams is playing, but the referee is trying to in favor of one team in the races. So we understand democracy is two teams competing equally with, with a fair referee. You are saying about a uh, type of regime in this new book, which is both teams try to bribe the referee, but the referee may be smoking or eating and doing nothing, so they have to continue playing by, by that sense. So in that sense, we are actually not talking about the, the idea of whether democracy or authoritarian uh, or fairness or unfairness is, is not entirely able to capture this type of dynamics. We are talking about a state capacity which is another dimension, like a three dimension in understanding political regimes. I mean, I think it does, and I, you know, I think you can, you know, pluralism by fault is not a regime type, per se. It's a sort of source of pluralism. Um, and, that's, and I think that, um, in a sense, that's, that's right, you know, sort of, um, and precisely because it merges that dysfunction, I think it can, you know, you know, you know corrupt, you know, this sort of, as, um, what, sorry, what's your name? Elena. Elena. Very corrupt place, and that's precisely the kind of place that, you know, in which, you know, a Tartarian was weak. I mean, I remember during the Orange Revolution, um, when I, I was, the Orange, I was in Kedavograd, and, uh, and the protest started, and I desperately wanted to get to Cade, but I was terrified they would shut off the city, they would be, I would be stuck in some middle of nowhere. Um, and so we were driving along, and the police tried to stop us from getting, from leaving, but the police were so corrupt that the, the cab just got out and just gave them a little bribe and they let us through. So that's sort of not a very effective authoritarian state. And that's sort of the essence of pluralism by default. Like, you know, the police are simply 
too corrupt to sort of impose effective authoritarian rule, which is the opposite of Armenia, by the way, which emerged out of war, and which they, they when, when major protests happened in 1996, the police just simply completely isolated Yerevan and was able to shut off Yerevan from any other you know, um, outside people coming in. So yeah, so it does, um, yeah, more out of Greek states. So. I don't know if that really answers your question. Yes, okay. Yes, let me ask this. Yes. Yeah, uh, how do you see actually the future of Ukraine in terms of political competition, in terms of, yeah, national maybe division with pro, with how we will, yeah. What, what is your vision? Um, you, know, I, you know, it's interesting because, I, I mean, um, so when I first sort of thought of this argument, in the mid 2000s, you know, I, I thought you, know, you, you could think that sort of political fault would eventually institutionalize into the real democracy. Um, you know, I just don't know. Yeah, I, I don't really see much evidence that this, you know, by itself leads to democracy. I mean, I think one thing, you know, potentially sort of, which I see as more plausible, is that the state's so weak, in other words, kind of civil society has kind of room to grow. Um, and then, you know, basically, if you want real democracy, you know, stable democracy that's not as unstable. You basically, sorry. Uh, you want basically, you want, you know, strong civil society. You know, you want, you know, you know, yeah. that's how you get. So the question, I, mean, I think, so one thing I think sort of, is that, you know, pulls by ball can sort of give room for civil society to develop in a way that you would not find in, in you know, more Singaporean or Belarusian type of state. But, um, so, I don't know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'm not especially optimistic, but yeah. especially if Trump becomes elected, then <laughs> we're all screwed. <laughs> so, yeah. Is there any more questions? Yes. 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 Uh, my question is actually related to the previous one slightly. What do you think? should be the role of Ukrainians living abroad. What they yeah, can do. Like, yeah, you know. <laughs> I really wanted to say, yeah, yeah, so. Um, uh, yeah. What should be the role? I mean, I think one thing, well, I think there are a lot of things that Ukrainians living abroad should not do. I think they should not, I think, um, is this recorded? Um, I won't say it. Never mind. Never mind. Um, yeah, maybe I can comment, you know, that actually we are launching a project now. So your question is uh, related to what we are launching at UBI, Ukraine Democracy Initiative here at the uni. So we are uh, looking into the role of diaspora in democratization in Ukraine, featured there in like home states of diaspora, right? So there is literature is not that well um, established on this topic, so there is not much, you know, response to that. You know, what they should do, what they've done, you know, how diaspora, uh, what is the role of diaspora in democratization of the sending state. But right? this takes time. Yeah. By the time your research or your uh, results of your research yeah. will go to the average person, it will take ages. And probably <laughs> not <laughs> about <laughs> not <laughs> that <laughs> 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 Probably not everyone will even reach it. So, uh, how? What about today? What? I mean, I think, I think, I think that. Um, I mean, one thing I think, you know, I think, you know, the author can do is take democracy seriously and really, you know, I think, encourage um, people to, to follow the rules and not take shortcuts. I think in the past there's been this sort of desire to take shortcuts, by which I mean sort of a lot of people supported Kushma because they thought, you know, they wanted to centralize really, the most important thing was to make sure that parliament had no power because the parliament was dominated by the communists and so there was sort of this movement by many abroad to support the centralization of these institutions, which I think, you know, was a mistake that we have to sort of support democratic institutions, which mean, you know, both courts but also, um, you know, you know, punishing people when they abuse um, democratic rules. And, you know, for example, not doing things like banning the Communist Party, which I just think is, is a really, that's not a good thing for the diaspora to do, is to encourage that. You know, I think you just, you know, you 
maintain support for democratic institutions. It's kind of obvious, but it's important to mm -hmm. Just to pick up on the, what can a diaspora do yeah. um, question, um, uh, two observations perhaps. The first of those being a moment in Estonia in the early post Soviet period where a bunch of um, Western trained, Western born, um, perhaps children of um, Estonian immigrants came and essentially populated the um, institutions of the government. That seems to work particularly well. I think a good historical reason why that worked in the same as well, which I'm sure you're aware of. But, and the second observation is around remittances. I mean, I'm uncertain what the, the volume of remittances is to the Ukraine. Like. Speaking of personal experience, I think that's quite high. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I think um, the relative low value of the Krivna and the I guess the support of the diaspora campaign that, that, and can play financially seems to be a, a positive role. That's largely at a sort of family to family level. But right. there are more organised efforts in terms of supporting um, uh, just veterans in the military at the which are quite common in the United States. So it's interesting that the first thing you, you know, actually, Pedashenko has tried. Well, with a little bit of success. But, you know, but I think that the problem is that. Um, I, mean, I don't know what you think, but you know, I think it hasn't really brought in foreigners to run these ministries, but these foreigners have no understanding of the sort of, you know, the sinews of power, so to speak, and so they tend to be very weak and unable to build coalitions. I mean, so I think that that has not worked particularly well. Maybe it's because it's a bigger country, I don't know. Um, but, it, it, you know, they really did try, I think there was a sort of sense that, you know, what we need to, you know, you know get rid of these old corrupt ministers, bring in outsiders who know, are well-intentioned and not corrupt, and that just, they try it, just have not worked. I mean, you know, um, I think in a sense, I think, you know, you know with the um, appointment of the new Prime Minister, voice in that time, was, you know, almost kind of, people kind of gave up on that as a strategy. Um, so, you know, I, unfortunately, you know, the first, and I think in terms of, you know, not to be really pessimistic, but, um, I mean, Ukrainians have not, compared to other providers, as much, you know, financing. As, um, as some hoped. Um, that's, um, yeah, yeah. Um. yeah, so Desper is helping a lot, of course, financially, right? Like you all know, I think many of you help, right? Sending money yeah. to support what's happening. But as well, there are a lot of exchange programs which exist on government yeah. level as well. Um, there are a lot of NGOs which were created, right? To actually foster this human rights discourse and, yeah, against violence, against war, against. But the Ukraine Democracy Initiative as well, you know, this is what we're yeah. doing, right? We're trying to do the academic time and research. Yeah, if this can calculate it, it's, you know, towards that. So many things are, yeah, happening, but they're not, yeah, we, we cannot measure the impact, right? Like, well, I think, the, um, you know, I'm very familiar with the work of Kek and Sicking around mm -hmm. um, uh, human rights organizations. I mean, effectively, the diaspora are NGOs, they're actually not Ukrainians, they're actually NGOs. Um, uh, and a network of NGOs to be mobilized. You know, yeah, I think that's that do play a very positive role. They can, mm -hmm. you know, in a kind of way of sort of amplifying messages about yes. human rights abuse. And countering from Russian propaganda. <coughs> right, countering. You know, I think that sense, that, you know, that I think that's actually been, you know, fairly successful. I think, you know, but it's been um, a very important role. I mean, and also look like, maintaining sort of inter Western interest in Ukraine. I think there's always a danger, of, yeah. you know, it's to kind of move on to the next crisis. And I think it's good, useful to have a constituency that's constantly, you know, encouraging people to keep paying attention to Ukraine. Um. And I want to say what you know, UDI is doing. I mean, yes, academic research takes a lot of time. But you know, research still coming out from the Orange Revolution that was over 10 years ago. It's crucial, actually, for this research to come out, no matter how long it takes, because the, this crisis will keep happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're still trying to catch up with the last <laughs> one. The research come out with another one. So Yeah, so we plan a book. Which we'll publish on that topic at the end of 2017. So I don't know, is it far away? Or what, a, what about the comments that Yasevchenko makes now in Brussels recently? It was yesterday, I think I read. She okay. said that actually nothing changed. One oligarchy to, was uh, moved out of power and the other one is taking over. And, and uh, rather the future is bleak. So this is what I, I just read it. Too. Yeah. 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 So we need to back everything with evidence, right? Like, I mean, that's yeah. a good claim, but again, you know, yeah. we need to do some, some research, you know, we should back it with some evidence that this 
And uh, what about young people? Do you have um, uh, Ukrainian as an HSC subject? Uh, sorry, once again, gateway. Ukrainian mm -hmm. language uh, as one of the subjects for selection for the HSC in Australia. Uh, in C. I don't think so because yeah. again, again, building the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, my command. <laughs> the last question, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, so yeah, we can yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I love your question. Come on, yeah. why are you so shy? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs>
the first one we have this description of the project on diaspora and democracy. You can just grab this thing there, just a paper on that, what we're doing. The second announcement, the most exciting. So Luca will talk to you even tomorrow. Chance, you know, to actually go and, and hear Luca tomorrow. And exactly. Ask all your questions. So you're probably all tired. So you're like, yeah, but it will be a different topic. Totally different topic. Yeah, yeah. So the topic would be why violent revolutions lead to the most durable dictatorships. Yeah, so it's actually co-hosted by uh, government and national relations department. So these guys are there. Yeah, so the experts as well in the field. So you can ask them questions. And the Sydney ideas. Yeah, so if you want to hear more from Lukan, yeah, just have a nice evening tomorrow. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> please, please come tomorrow. Yeah, thanks so much for attending. Yeah. Swipe down to stop. Swipe down to stop. Swipe down to stop.